Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. So today let's solve a bit of a more interesting problem, minimum number of increments on subarrays to form a target array. So idea here is that we're given a target array that we want to form. And we're also given an initial array. So I'll kind of just draw this over here. And then below that, the initial array is going to be of the exact same size. So in this case, five elements, but they're all going to be zero. So that's pretty simple. What we want to do is transform this one into the target array. And the only operation we are allowed to do is select any subarray from here. So any contiguous subarray. And we can then increment each of those by one. So if we select this subarray, then we are basically turning all of these into a one. Maybe next time we do this subarray over here, then we're turning uh, this into a two by incrementing it. And then each of these is going to be one, something like that. So there's many ways for us to take this and form the target array, but we want to return the minimum number of operations to do that. And it's guaranteed that we would be able to do that because I mean, the most naive way would be this, like, okay, pick this element. How many increments do we have to do? Just a single one. Okay, that's one operation. Pick this element. How many times do we have to increment it? Twice. Okay, that's two operations. And then we kind of just keep going. So technically, if you just take the sum of the array, that is a valid way uh, that's that gives you a valid number of operations to form the target array. It just doesn't happen to be the minimum one. So we want the minimum one. If your brain isn't going in the direction of maybe there's a greedy solution to this problem, well, it should be because yes, I mean, there could be like a backtracking solution to this. There could be a brute force solution. There could be a simulation. There could be a ton of different solutions, maybe even dynamic programming. But if there is a greedy solution to this problem, it's probably not only going to be really simple, but it's also going to probably be really efficient. That's kind of the whole idea behind greedy algorithms. They're simple and efficient, but there's usually a trick behind them. And I think the easiest way to know the trick behind this problem is to try to visualize it. That's usually my recommendation. So this first example isn't the best one because the solution to this first example is going to be three. Can you tell me what the solution is going to be? Well, think about it this way. For the first subarray, we, we can try to be greedy. We can try to get the entire array and increment everything because we know everything needs to be incremented at least once. So increment everything. That's one operation. Now everything is going to be a one. That's good. But there's still some elements that need to be increased. But luckily, they are contiguous. So what we can do is now select this subarray. This guy's good. This guy's good, but we want to increment everything here. Okay. Now we have a two here, two here, two here. Now this guy's good. This is good. Just the three in the middle needs to be incremented. So then for the last subarray, we select this. This guy will be three now. So it took us three operations. This example was simple because we were always able to do contiguous subarrays, but let's make this example a bit more interesting. Let me turn this into something else. We're going to start with the same thing. One, two, three, then going down to two, then going down to one. But now I'm going to start increasing it again. I'm going to do two. I'm going to do three. Now you probably see where I'm going with this because for the first subarray, yes, we're going to increment everything. But once we have that, once we have a bunch of ones, now we want to increment this part, but we also want to increment this part, but we can only choose a contiguous subarray. So we have to do these two separately. So right now we're just kind of building the intuition by going through this example. I haven't really done anything fancy. I haven't told you what the solution is, but hopefully you're starting to get some of the intuition because there's a couple ways we can do this. And one is like an N squared approach and one is a linear approach. I guess you could say both of them are greedy, but this one is probably a bit more greedy and this one is actually more simple. Even the code is more simple. So this is the one I'm going to prefer, but I'll briefly mention how the N squared solution would go because it's kind of similar to this simulation that we're doing here. Um, what we would do is basically scan through the input and find the minimum. Sometimes there's going to be a tie. That's okay, but we'd find the minimum in this case, let's say it's this one. So we scanned through everything and we know the minimum was one. So, what we do is we'll say, okay, whatever this minimum value was, we're going to increment our array that many times, our entire array. 
it was just a one, so we just increment once. And then what we would do is we'd say, okay, now we're gonna do the exact same thing on the remaining portion of the array. And we would keep track of how much we've incremented so far. And then we'd kind of scan through this again, and then we'd find the minimum here. And this time we wouldn't increment, but uh, the more interesting thing would be here, we would then split up the array. We'd uh, recursively do the same thing on the left side, and then we'd recursively do the same thing on the right side. So that's kind of a recursive way to solve the problem. But since we are scanning through the array at each step and eliminating one element at each step, the time complexity is gonna be roughly n squared. I'm not gonna cover that, but the code for that solution should be on neatcode.io. I will link that in the description if you want. And I have the code in several languages. But now for the greedy solution, to visualize it, it's kind of like this. Imagine we have like a mountain. So like this is one, this is two, this is three, and then this is two again. And so I'm kind of drawing it as like a bar graph and it's not like the best drawing, so I apologize for that. But to simplify this, you see it's like increasing, then it's decreasing. And I don't know why I put the one on such uneven levels. Let me redraw this. Okay, and the good thing is that drawing it this way actually makes it even more simple because it kind of just tells you what the solution is anyway, right? Like these blocks. But anyway, so notice how we are kind of increasing, right? And then we're decreasing and then we're increasing. So first of all, we know for sure that we cannot eliminate this guy and this guy at the same time. We just can't. We wish we could. We wish we could draw that rectangle in between, but there's a gap there. So that's the whole trick. These valleys, these local minimums are what's going to be the hard part about this greedy solution, because otherwise we could just iterate over this guy and just keep track of the maximum. I'd just say, okay, well, I have a three. I need to do this operation three times. And yeah, that does work up until here because we can do one operation to eliminate this. So all of these guys and then one operation here and then one operation there. So it does work. And actually it works even when we extend it. One operation, two operations, three operations, and it keeps working until here as well. One, two, three. But where does the problem come from? When we extend it, now we're trying to go back up. Well, I can eliminate all of this in one. I can eliminate all of this in one and this in one, but what about that guy? Can't do it. We need four operations. Okay, so knowing that, how do we actually solve this problem then? What's the algorithm? Well, I, I think there probably is a way to actually just uh, enumerate like all of these mountains and then get the max height of each individual mountain. So we have like one mountain over here, which is a height three. And then we have another half mountain over here, which is of height three again. But we also have to consider the shared part. It's not gonna take three plus three operations. It's not gonna take six operations. It's gonna take, I believe five, because they do have some commonality like here. So it's gonna be one, two, three, four, five operations. So this is kind of where the logical jump happens. You might have understood everything I said up until now, but to actually arrive at the solution does take a bit of thinking, a bit of trial and error. So I'll walk you through my thought process. Let's say we start here at one. It could have been any other number. It could have been a three. It could have been a four, whatever. We know at minimum, we're gonna need this many operations. So let's just set our result to that. Result is equal to one. Okay, now I'm gonna go to the next element, two. And two happens to be bigger than the previous element, one. So I know for sure we're gonna need at least two total operations to form the target array. So you might think to maybe just maintain the max. And yeah, that would kind of work as we're increasing, but there's a more a general formula, which is, I guess I actually won't jump into the general formula for now. Let's just say, okay, like while it is increasing, we would wanna keep track of the max. And so we have two, okay, and then we go to three. But the problem with that is it kind of becomes harder to update the result as we know there's gonna be some peaks and valleys. So the better approach is to uh, do this, is to say, okay, we need at least one operation to get rid of this guy. And we know that's gonna keep extending. We don't know how far it's gonna extend. Maybe there's gonna be some zeros over here, that's fine. But we know it's gonna extend up until some point. Okay, then we get to two. Two is bigger than the previous value one. So we need uh, to eliminate this part as well. 
We did already eliminate the guy underneath, but we just need this extra value. So how do we get that extra delta? Just take the difference between this and the previous one. So we say two minus the previous one, one, that gives us this one over here. We don't know again how far it's gonna extend, but it'll extend as far as we need it to. And then, uh, so that difference one is gonna be added to here. So we'll do result is one plus one. Then we get to three, same exact thing. We know we had this stuff, but we take the difference between these guys to get this delta, which is one again. So uh, one plus one plus one. Now we know three operations are needed at minimum. Who knows, maybe those three operations are actually enough for the entire array. In this case, it's not true. So now it's gonna get interesting. Now we're decreasing. Now I see a two. So previously I had a three, but now I see a two. Now, do we actually need more operations to get rid of this two? Not really, because yeah, we had a height of three at this part. We don't need to extend it all the way. We can actually just extend two of them. So. If this guy is less than the previous one, it's okay, no additional work is required. Because if we were able to increment up to three, this guy's connected to three, thus this would have been incremented up to two as well. And now, once again, we are at a lower element one, so we could have extended this as well, no additional work required. This all makes sense because you can see we only need three operations to get this far, and then finally we get to two. Now we're increasing, this is where it gets interesting two is bigger than the previous one, one. So what are we gonna do? Exact same thing as before. Yes, over here we had a height of two, but we know that since we got to one, we could not extend that two any further. So thus, we were at one, we need to go back up to two, that delta is gonna be one, we add that to our result, now we're at a height of two, finally we get to three, same exact thing, three minus two is gonna be plus one, and we fill that in as well. So result here is gonna be five. You can see that was pretty uh, efficient. It was just a linear pass, no extra space required. That's gonna be constant. I think the key to understanding the solution is just kind of visualizing it this way. It makes everything a lot easier. And if you are interested, you can check out NeatCode.io, which does have a pretty good greedy section, especially if you check out the NeatCode 250 list. It's the new one. So after that long-winded explanation, the solution, uh, the code is gonna be pretty simple. So we're gonna have our result. I'm not gonna initialize it to zero actually because uh, when, when you, we loop through the code, if we do something like this, let's say I in range uh, length of target and we want the target element, we wanna know is the current target element greater than the previous one? So target of i minus one. Well, what if that goes out of bounds? So that's why we're just gonna start at one like this to uh, not have to deal with that. And then the result, we will initialize with the first value from target because we know at least we're gonna need that many operations um, to get that first number. And then maybe we'll be able to extend this or maybe not, let's see. So the way I described it in the walkthrough was kind of like this. If the target is greater, what we're gonna do is say uh, result, add to it uh, the difference. So target of i minus target of i minus one. Otherwise, they are equal or the current value is smaller than the previous one. Well, in both of those cases, we really don't have to do anything. So actually we don't need this else case. So uh, it's really this simple. And then I think we can just return our result as long as we're iterating over the rest of the array. So uh, let's give that a run. Okay, really, really sloppy mistake. You guys can tell I'm pretty rusty here. We should have put a zero there. And now you can see the code does work. It's pretty efficient. If you care to get rid of this if statement, what you can do is uh, replace this with a max of that or zero, because that means that if this number were zero or it were negative, then we will kind of just ignore it. We'll just replace it with a zero and then add zero to this. So then you don't need the if statement up above, but I don't really think that makes much of a difference. Maybe the previous code was more clear to you. Anyways, if you found this helpful, check out neatcode.io for more. Thanks for watching, I'll see you soon.